episode 80, how art class made me a better photographer. Welcome to the Visionary Variety Podcast, where we cover cool stuff like photo, video, film, books, and technology. So switch on your brain and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Daniel Grove, your host. We've also got with us on this show, Nate Gunn. Hey, hey. We're going to be talking about a few different things, mostly centered around what has helped us become a better photographer and videographer, uh, what has increased the quality and the creativity, and really just the overall value of our art that we make. Before we get to that part, Nate, let's talk a little bit about our history and kind of how we've got to the point where we are now. So with you, you're primarily right now a videographer, but you got to that point through photography. Is that right? Yeah. So my dad came from the photography world. And so there were cameras just kind of laying around and at special events um, over time, he just kind of showed me and he was like, Hey, you want to start doing it? And so he could socialize with the adults. And <laughs> so it kind of became like this thing that I wanted to do it. And so free child labor. Cool. Pr- pretty much. So we started <laughs> with like photos and then camera and video cameras and VHS yeah. cameras and all so, that fun stuff. So how did you learn the technical side of operating the cameras? Well, a lot of it just kind of was trial and error as a kid and then my dad would just say throw it in automatic um maybe later we'll show and then he would show me and then i'm like well guess what i forgot so on previous episodes i've said how i got started in video uh about 11 years old i started doing actual video work a lot of that of course was the director in the back could kind of set all the settings and if they had a problem they'd send a guy over and you know talk you through some stuff so just kind of a lot of visual and I'm a visual learner. So I started picking up on it and outside of that kind of stuff, I was doing, you know, photos for fun for friends. And I was like, man, I want that look and I want that look in video too. So <laughs> I just, just like getting not irritated, but just frustrated. And I was like, man. And then my dad, he's like, well, if you want to do video, you need to learn photo because video is moving picture. So just master a still and, get the basics on your belt and moving forward video will be a lot easier. Awesome. For me, learning the technical side was a lot of trial and error, but also it was like the creative part of my brain wanting to have more control and wanting to express yeah. itself better through the equipment that I had. Now, when I was, I think maybe a sophomore in high school, I got or maybe junior. I don't remember exactly. Way, way back in the day. <laughs> yeah, way back, like way too long ago. Um, my dad got me for Christmas this $500 point and shoot. And it was a really nice point and shoot camera. Wow. Yeah, at the time nice it was a lot, but it had, I think, 10 or 12 megapixels, <laughs> which at the time was like, well. That was quality then. So Yeah. Now, mind you, megapixels is not all it's, you know, beefed up to be, but that's a topic no. for another episode. Anyway, so this camera was really nice for the time, and it had manual controls. On a point and shoot at the time? What? Yeah. It didn't have removable lens, but it had a decent, like, probably like, a tw- I think it was like a 12 millimeter to maybe 80 or something like that. It could zoom out and yeah. zoom in. So. I uh, took pictures and, you know, I I wanted to have more control. And I noticed when I was on auto, it showed the settings moving around. I was like, what are these little numbers jumping around? You know, when when I'm pointing at a bright scene, the numbers kind of are like this. And when I'm in a dark area, my numbers go to these numbers. And I started to wrap my head around like, okay, this this has to do with like the brightness and the exposure. And then Mm -hmm. when I learned about, you know, uh, exposure time or what's more commonly called shutter speed, uh, I learned about motion blur and and you know long exposures and how that all worked. I was putting the pieces of the puzzle together in my head slowly, yeah. and before I knew it, I was shooting in manual before I knew that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't like how auto made decisions for me. I was like, this is not what an artist should do. I mean, now if you use auto, I'm not going to judge you. I'm really not. But for me, yeah. I said, you know, for this artist right here, myself, this is not how I want to do my art. I want to have control over what's happening. I might want to underexpose photo. I might want a really bright photo. How is the camera mm-hmm. going to know? So, uh, yeah, manual was, well, I got started manual real early, like pretty much right off the, from the starting. Yeah. And that, that, that's pretty much how I learned the technical side of operating my camera. And that was great because it, 
you know, carried over to when I got a DSLR. And I still use those skills that I learned to this day. So that's the technical side of, you know, my photography. The creative side, which is sort of, uh, I like to say, kind of the flip side of the coin. Because if you don't have yeah. either, you're going to suffer. You're going to really be limited in what you can <laughs> capture. You might be super yeah. creative. Like, you might have an imagination that would just blow my mind. But if you can't do it on your camera or at a shoot, I'm not impressed. Um, and honestly, you're not going to do great as a photographer if you can't bring it in terms of technical or creative. You got to have both sides. So the creative side, I uh, I learned just, I mean, that's for the, more of the natural side. You, you can learn the technical side, right? Anyone can learn the terminology. They can yeah. learn the buttons and operations of manual or lights or whatever. But not everyone can learn the creative side. And I might even be controversial and say that you can't, if you're not a creative person, you can't learn it. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, there's plenty of <laughs> photographers out there that have yeah have made it happen regardless of they're not really creative, but they still have a business. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for them because well, I mean, I've met a lot of those people before uh, where they're not super creative, but yeah. their images are amazing, but mm -hmm. they're kind of, eh, you know, but yeah. it's like the people that know not so much of the head knowledge of how things work, but they're super creative and they you give them a camera and they figure it out. It's like, dang, how'd yeah. you figure that out? I don't know. I just kind of did mm -hmm. that and did this. And yeah. you're thinking, that's not fair. That took me five years to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those, those prodigies. I, I've come across them in my day and I'm so jealous. I'm like, oh, if I knew what you just learned when I started, like it took me, I calculated at one point, it took me about eight years to get to a point where I was proud of my photos and I knew what I was doing. Um, and honestly, I could have learned that eight years worth of t stuff in about one year. <laughs> but technology is also helping a lot. So oh, yes, YouTube. Uh, and it's like social media. I've always wanted stable footage, so I got a gimbal, and then somebody gets like a camera five axis like um, image stabilization inside, and they're walking around in similar look, and I'm like, that's not fair. Dang it! I work yeah. my butt off. <laughs> I spent money to buy a thing to do that, and your camera does yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. So creative side, um, I, uh, I've i always been a creative person, always um, yeah. an artist in various ways. Uh, I made like really elaborate and detailed technical and also really creative stuff with Lego as a kid. And that was my, my creative expression as a younger child. And then I, uh, I also did a lot of drawing and that kind of carried past my Lego phase. And then my drawing kind of ended around the time where I discovered photography. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, kind of like one, like steps, like stepping stones to yeah. a career really <laughs> not to be not to be dramatic about lego but i mean they they did help me in a lot of ways that have helped me today and what i did do what i do you can be dramatic about lego okay. <laughs> dude lego <laughs> i'll stand i'll stand my ground lego is the best toy ever like yeah i'll spend money on lego what about you how did you kind of learn a creative side did you do you feel like it was always with you or did you pick it up slowly well as a kid uh i was super interested in building stuff and legos and jumping on the computer and trying to figure it out just always curiosity and i think a lot of it had to do with like like i said curiosity and creativity and figuring out how to funnel it in one spot it's just led to one thing after another and then you know people are like how'd you learn that i'm like uh, yeah i just kind of did it and <laughs> they're like well did you do it on purpose no <laughs> can you do it again yeah. uh <laughs> yeah um that's a good example of how creativity is sort of an inside thing that just comes out of you from time to time. You can learn to express it better. There's no technical equation to it. It makes it fun if you can kind of ride the creativity ride, totally. you know, through life, no matter how old you get and not lose your imagination. Yes. Things like photo, things like video and whatever else you're doing are mm -hmm. still a lot of fun. Like they, when you were a kid, you were very curious. And so keep that moving forward. Like, and I, I tell people all the time, like, they're like, how did you do this in video? And I'm like, uh, I didn't give up my imagination as a kid. That's good. <laughs> and I just wanted to be that <laughs> one <deep>. person. <laughs> it's so deep, but don't lose it. Well, we'll get to that topic soon. Uh, but that's a great, great point is you got to, as an adult, you got to learn to keep your imagination alive. And there's different things you can do to stimulate that and to push yourself sometimes outside of your comfort zone to find something new and to find a new way of doing something. I've found myself getting into a pattern or a rhythm of how I edit my photos, right? I always do the same tricks yeah. to get the same result. But along the road somewhere, I thought to myself, what if I do these sliders the exact opposite? Like instead of, you know, dropping the highlights and raising the shadows and bumping the contrast up, what would it look like if I did the opposite? And I've actually found some really interesting looks that are something that I never would have imagined because I'm so used to what I'm doing in Lightroom or Photoshop. So doing the exact opposite sometimes 
has brought me to, you know, maybe a first step of finding a new look. Maybe that, that's probably not the finish, you know, result, but yeah. hey, it's something. And, and I never would have thought of doing that unless I had the creative idea. What if I do this opposite? Let's just see what happens. You know, it, it can't hurt, right? Just try it out. Yeah, and being somebody that's been kind of behind the scenes, there's been a lot of events that you've been to. You're like, I know nothing about the character, but I will figure it out. <laughs> and you kind of put yourself in a position where you're like, yeah, just tell me what it is, and we'll take pictures. And at the end, it's like it, it's like you knew that character yeah. or that trilogy or that series, but it was just because mm-hmm. you put yourself in a position, and you're like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be creative. I'm curious. Yeah. And you just pushed yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one thing that's really increased my quality of my work uh, is planning ahead of time. Um, I, I can do a lot on the, on the spot, on the fly, but planning ahead of time has really brought my quality uh, of my work up a lot. And, and that includes homework, which is fun homework. When it's cosplay, it's fun. I get to watch YouTube videos. Yeah. I get to read really in-depth Wikipedia articles that I normally have no idea what they're talking about. But eventually I start to piece it all together and I, and I realize, okay, for the photo shoot, I know exactly what to do, and it's going to be awesome. You know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we're about to talk about this in the next two <laughs> in two points from now. But the next yeah, yeah, point, yeah. the next next point here is uh, when you look at your old work, how much do you cringe? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> I cringe, shiver, get a blanket, and get in the fetal position. <laughs> Rock back and forth, suck my thumb. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Friends, don't let friends make this. <laughs> every time i look back at something that i forgot i did or i did for like an old church video that they mm. recapped like five or ten years later i'm like oh, oh no oh, don't and i'm like that. please nobody recognize that <laughs> <laughs> no i don't want accreditation no accreditation yeah. nope nope don't i don't say. want exposure bucks on nothing <laughs> <laughs> refund those exposure bucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean it goes, it goes both ways for like video and photo there's photos i've taken at family events just for fun and i'm like ooh let's not remember who took that photo just remember the moment <laughs> <laughs> but do you have stuff that you're proud of oh yeah of course sometimes you got to take that cringe and just make it better and realize that it. you're not in that spot in that anymore yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah but there's a lot of things backwards that you think you're like man like that's so cool like look at me <laughs> like using a 50 dollar point and shoot camera and made the whole music video like what the heck that's so cool but i would probably wouldn't do it again but <laughs> how about you like do you have any cringe moments you're just like oh no yeah but i got through those pretty early on thankfully um like the the big pitfall that i look back and see in my old earlier work is contrast i discovered the contrast slider and i thought it was the bee's <laughs> knees man i cranked that contrast up way too high um and you know it gives unnatural skin tones uh of course you got blown out highlights and like muddy black you know dark spots of the photo so i thought contrast was like the coolest enhancement to a photo and, and i overdid it for a and while you have, and you have some of those uh select a color and everything uh, else is black and white i did selective color a few <laughs> times but even then i knew this isn't normal like this isn't how we see the world yeah maybe i shouldn't do this too much but i did do it a little bit of it. and i learned my I, again i learned my lesson early thankfully uh <laughs> to not do that because people look like zombies when their shirt is colorful and their skin's black and white why just why <laughs> why is it an option i don't even I don't know, know why know. When I, yeah, when I look back on most of my work, uh, about 90, 95% of it, I'm really proud of it because I, I bring back the memories of me learning and seeing those photos. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm so proud of myself right now because I made a legitimate looking photo or this wedding photo looks yeah. awesome. And, and I, I did it myself with no with no college, no training. <laughs> I did this. Yeah. That's a good feeling. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of my work. I had a lot of real creative stuff that before I got into portraiture, I did a lot of abstract landscapes and still life and objects and macros that... Uh, are still pretty awesome and i did some really cool like yeah. uh, composite foot not not a composite like uh like my superhero composites but i would mash together all these abstract photos into this really trippy piece of like digital art and uh i i still can't yeah. recreate those because <laughs> i was just flowing no. you know i was like flowing in the creative groove and they're cool <laughs> i need to find some of those old ones and post them <laughs> yeah I've but, done. i guess if you can get past the cringy and just yeah. remember all the good that came out of that yeah, or that. just the fun or the memory <laughs> When was like the turning point in the quality of your work? The turning points for me where, you know, I I noticed my quality jumping dramatically or my photos getting better or cooler were there's really just three main points. And for me, they're mostly equipment related. So, for example, when I purchased my first actual lens, aside from the kit lens that came with the camera kit, I bought the 50 yeah. millimeter Canon 1.4 which uh, ooh, ooh. 350 bucks. That was a lot of money for me at the time. I was a broke college student in Austin paying for college out of pocket. 
So like, <laughs> you can't get any broker than that living in Austin. You're like, this is my lens and my only lens oh, for a man. while. <laughs> I made that lens. I used that lens almost exclusively for about 15 weddings in a row. And because that's all yeah. I had, I couldn't afford anything else. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew my kit lenses weren't going to do the job. So anyway, yeah, the 50 millimeter w- opened up a whole new bracket of types of photos I could take. I could shoot in darker rooms now. I could do the dramatic bokeh where the background is blurry and the foreground's sharp. I could just do a lot more photos that I really I couldn't do with a kit lens. So that was a big yeah. jump. My next my my next noticeable jump was when I bought wireless uh, speed lights and I, I got off camera lighting. So I put my speed lights on you know light stands instead of on my camera. And I got a soft box and man, my photos went to a whole new level because I could get that great professional look. And mm-hmm. if the lighting wasn't great, who cares? I can add light to make it look great. And that's that was awesome too. Um, being able to add light to a scene and control the light. You know, when the sun, when, when you're shooting with the sun, you're at the sun's mercy. And when the sun goes down, you're done. <laughs> if the sun's behind something, well, you can't fix that. But with flash, I could change that. And my third kind of noticeable jump in quality happened when I got into composite editing. So that's where yeah. I take a portrait of someone and I erase the background and I add a fake background or I get five different photos and make a brand new background with a fake mountain, yeah. fake sky, fake buildings. And I do my best to make it look real. That's that's the whole trick to composite editing is you make it look photorealistic and you make it yeah. all mesh together to where it looks like your subject, your person is in that world, is in that scene. Um, I hated the, the idea of doing composite editing because I knew up ahead of time, I knew how much work it was going to be hours, you know, hours spent on tedious work with, uh, you know, what I thought would be minimal, you know, results. I thought uh, it would always look cheesy. I, I didn't imagine I could ever make a good, cool looking composite that people would actually pay yeah. money for. So I didn't even spend time learning it, but I, I eventually did get into it. And my first composite was a, a photo of a girl I took inside. It was a, a Ray, a Star Wars Ray cosplay. And I added uh, desert dunes and a sky behind her. And it looked pretty <laughs> decent. Very simple composite, mind Yeah. You. Very simple. There was actually, there was no feet involved, so I didn't have to do the placement in the ground. Um, but yeah, and that kind of convinced me. I was like, okay, I think I might give this another try. You know, I, I'm not going to give up on it completely. So when I really started to get good at compositing, that that's when my work went to a whole new level. What were some of your turning points or jumps in quality? I think it dawned on me that that moment had happened when I was taking what I was doing and explaining it to somebody, and it was just coming natural. And I was like, what the heck? Like, I really do know this. And I would look at other people's work, and I was just like, whoa. (laughs) Like, I am, what the heck? Like, I didn't even realize that I've moved in quality. I'm, Uh like, matched with some of these people. (laughs) And so I didn't realize quality has been, like, upping until I started looking at other people's work, and I'm like, hey. I'm like, I'm doing the same kind of stuff they're doing. I'm not, I'm not bad. <laughs> yeah, and it's like coming to me like effortlessly. I'm like, mm. that's so easy. That's cool. Those moments were happening, and then I get like another lens or a not go from crop to full frame. And I was like, hey, look at all that quality. It was just mind-blowing. And a lot of it didn't even occur to me that these moments were happening until people started saying, hey, I saw your work or I saw whatever you did. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that. I didn't even know you could do that. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I just plugged the camera, turned it on manual, plugged the microphone, and, like, calm down. <laughs> that's easy to you, though. That That's really advanced for other people. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't – that's what I'm saying. A lot of it didn't, like, occur to me that yeah. moments like that were happening until people started, like, stopping and telling me. And I was just like, calm down. They're like, why is your stuff not on YouTube? I'm like, well, it's not because it's not that good. And they're like, no, <laughs> dude, like, for real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I posted this question on uh, the San Antonio Photography Facebook group, which I'm very active on. And I I love posting open-ended questions on Facebook uh, because the responses you get, you never know what you're going to get. It could be something really (laughs) funny. It could be something really serious. And, you know, like, oh, this this just got real. But um, I like to post on the photography group sometimes, too, to see, you know, what other photographers um, think about a a topic. And everyone's journey is so different. You never know what they're going to say. And you can learn a lot from just, or putting an open into question that's not right or wrong, but someone's opinion is important. So I posted, I said, what are the three things that made you a better photographer in terms of creativity, style, technique, or your know, image quality increasing? And uh, I got a lot of great response. I can't read them all, unfortunately. I do want to read just a few of them. So this one is from Ricky Lopez. He said, shooting nothing but black and white for about a year and a half. Wow. Shooting with apertures of F5.6 to F9 learning how to use available light to my advantage, whether it be hard midday sun or diffused overcast lighting. It really forced me to work on composition and lighting. So that's awesome. 
Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people are shooting as wide as they can, F1.8 or 2 or 2.8. Uh, what about the other averages? You know, shoot at 22. <laughs> what happens if you shoot at F22? <laughs> you will have the sharpest image possible. Um, and I, I actually like shooting at 5.6 because I know almost for sure it's going to be tack sharp and uh, no issues with blurriness. So that's great. Uh, Jennifer Ritter said, experience and time, confidence, and shooting things I'm not used to to get out of my comfort zone. That is huge. I'm going to talk more about that later. Jeff Zavala said, learning not to compare myself against people who have been shooting for a decade. Too many people overlook the process and just want the results. Very true. Comparing has its benefits, but you can definitely, it's a slippery slope, you know, comparing yourself to other photographers and videographers. You don't want to get yeah, crazy it with it because you could start to feel really insecure. You can feel lost and hopeless and like, I'll never be that good. And it's yeah. just, that's a waste of time right there. There's a bunch of lies and un, unfruitful thinking that will never, never help you get better. <laughs> Heather Almendarez says, I draw a ton of inspiration from other cultures right now. I've been really trying to study their lighting and editing techniques. That's an interesting thought. This is not her, but uh, that's an interesting thought because other countries do have kind of their own styles and their own trends with photography. We have our own in America, but what about the other countries in the world? Never thought about that. Uh, she also goes on to say, practice and more practice. And then honestly, the support of my friends and family keeps me going. It helps me to want to push harder and learn more. The more support they show, the harder I work. That's great. Yeah. That's very true. When you got support of people around you, even if they're not family, it will really just lift your spirits and keep you going through those hard times. Uh, Johnny Guerrero says, shooting something every day, working with an experienced and professional model and lighting. So true. When you work with an experienced professional model, yeah, right. it's a world of difference from an amateur. <laughs> and lastly, Taylor Odiambo says, style, studying fashion photography, aesthetics, and vintage fashion magazines, such as Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, etc. Quality, shooting each and every day. Creativity, never copying Pinterest or other photographers. <laughs> Pinterest. And getting my inspiration from other sources. So that's awesome. I hope that has helped somebody out there and inspired you to try something new. Yeah. Lots of great entries on that post. All right, so talking about inspiration, Nate, do you have any videographers or artists that you follow that kind of keep you on track and, you know, show you something to reach for? They are a lot of photographer videographers, like okay. Peter McKinnon, Jesse Driftwood, Sam Calder, and Chris Hugh. Now, these guys are all filmmakers, photographers, and, man, they're just so current, up-to-date, and <laughs> it kind of blows my mind how simple, like, I'm sure it kind of feels like when those people came to me and said, hey, Nate, your stuff's really good. That's kind of how I feel. I'm like, man, you make that look so easy. Yeah. Like, just easy and mind-blowing. And I'm like, man. Jesse Driftwood is the coolest name ever. <laughs> yeah, dude. And, <laughs> and Chris For those Hugh? that don't know, he got, like, super popular off of Instagram for doing oh. the transitions and stuff. Oh, cool. And so if you were ever bored, just type in Jesse Driftwood on Instagram. I and will. just look at his stories. Yeah, I, I have never heard these names before because I don't follow, you know, same stuff that you follow. So I'm looking forward to yeah. seeing... What inspires you? That'll be fun. Um, all right. For me, I've got a few photographers that really inspire me and just kind of remind me that I'm not the best. Then you realize what you are, you are on the food chain. You're like, well, oh, I'm nothing. I'm a worm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a musician. When you go to your favorite band's concert and you're like, I'm going to quit music right now. I'll never be like, I just, <laughs> pretty much, why? pretty much. Why like, waste my time? <laughs> right on the nail of what that means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I quit music right now. It's kind of that feeling, but in photography, you, you see just amazing photos and you have to appreciate how much better it is than you, but you can't let that overtake you. You can't say I'll never yeah. make that because then you'll never make that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like they're doing that stuff with the same gear you have. You're like, Oh, oh yeah. well, uh, so for me, I've got four photographers. Von Wong inspires me a lot. He does a lot of like cause related stuff. Like he'll do yeah. a photo shoot to bring awareness to pollution in the ocean or to child labor in other countries. That's cool photographers. Oh yeah. Uh, all these guys are awesome. So Von Wong is really inspirational. Not because it's not, not only because his, his work is technical and creative, but because it has a story and it really has a purpose. Like it, he, he's doing like good causes for, you know, humanitarian yeah. stuff. Uh, next is Josh Rossi. He is a compositor. I think he's out of California and he does really cool superhero composites and professional composites for people that are just really, really well done. Like he, his images yeah. all just mesh together and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful imagery. 
he got really famous for doing a photo shoot of his daughter uh, when she was three as Wonder Woman. Super cute, but like really powerful, fierce you know, facial yeah, expressions and epic photos he did of her. It was really cool. So Josh Rossi is great. Next is Chris K. He is in Houston. Chris. Yeah, not too far from us. And he has been on the podcast before. That was such a fun episode. So on Facebook, his account name is Cosplay Composites. And this is where he posts his, of course, cosplay composites. Dude, it, and when I see his stuff, it looks like we walked into like a VR set. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how the freak did you get that? <laughs> like his stuff is just so beautiful with the lighting and the the, the backgrounds. And, and he, he does a great job with the subject too. Like he doesn't just yeah. do cool backgrounds. He photographs his people really, really well. And, yeah. And that episode that he was on, he broke it down. I'm like, yeah. man, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy yeah i've learned a lot from him and uh, i think he might have learned a thing or two from me too i don't know we like to chat and uh kind of bounce ideas off each other but before before he'll post a finished composite sometimes he'll send it to me or i'll send one to him and say hey what's wrong with this photo <laughs> you know like please like tear this to pieces <laughs> so i can make it better <laughs> and and that's great to have people like that you know people that you can be honest with but not get butthurt over you're like they might say dude your photo it's just not it's just awkward. And that, now you know why I don't send <laughs> stuff to people. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, my feelings hurt. So Chris K is awesome, and uh, I love that guy. Uh, Anthony L is the next composite photographer that really inspires me. He's up in Seattle. And similar to Chris, we, we just chat about, you know, photo. Like, if he does a photo shoot, he'll show me previews before anyone else gets to see it. So cool. Yeah. Um, I, I've actually done a little a collaboration with him recently. He did a really cool composite of Supergirl out in space uh, in orbit around the earth. And she is using her laser vision to fix or m like re weld a piece of a spacecraft. That's like breaking apart or it's, Whoa. it's a, a space station. And he wrote me, he's like, Hey, can you like help me with this space station? <laughs> I need, uh, I need this. I need some pieces. I need some space debris. I need some that's cables. So, cool. so I, I went in blender. I made him uh, 3d objects and props to use in his composite. And he used them. And that was really cool. So, uh, with our powers combined. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he's a really great photographer and composite editor. And the, the way he uses color and atmosphere and flair is just so, so inspirational to me. I, I want to learn to shoot like him. And for him, it's simple. Like he, I, yeah. I, I write him all the time. Like, how did you do this photo? He's like, oh, well, I had a blue light here, purple light here. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really not a big deal. <laughs> I'm like, this photo and, is so cool. <laughs> and you're on this and you're like hitting the desk. You're like, boo, boo, why? Dang why it, is it so, so simple, simple for them? <laughs> yeah, it's too easy for you. It's not fair. But I've been to that place too where people write me, how did you do this photo? I'm like, it's actually not that hard, guys. It's like I have a softbox here and a light behind them. It's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, I've had moments like that. Like I'll post something on, on my Instagram, my Insta story, and they're like, Nice stock footage, bro. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's uh, not stock thanks. footage. That's me outside doing stuff. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, those are the four guys that really inspire me. It's good to have people that inspire you and challenge you. Like I said earlier, people that you you won't talk to in person that you can just look to and say, like, see, what is the industry standard right now? Like, what is the best possible work out there for portraits, for sports photos, for yeah. model photos, whatever your thing is? Find that yeah. and follow that, but also find try to find some people that you can actually chat to in person and have a relationship with where they can give you constructive criticism. That'll really help mm -hmm. you a lot. Okay, so next thing here to improve your quality in your work is challenges. Uh, and that is basically something that you impose on yourself that pushes you outside your box, outside your formula, outside of your comfort zone. And it kind of makes you do something different. And on the journey of doing that, you're going to learn a lot of new stuff. So some of the things here are uh, 365 day challenges. So these are things where you Ooh. are challenged to take a photo every day for a whole year. Dang, dude. Yeah. It can be with your phone. It doesn't have to be a whole light. Yeah, no, I get it. But not a photo dang. shoot, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it could, uh, sometimes they have certain guidelines, like, you know, it needs to show an emotion or needs to have this color, whatever. Um, others are just really open-ended. Um, so that's, that's a fun challenge to keep you active and, and, trying new things take a picture of your face 365 times <laughs> another is on facebook groups sometimes there will be a weekly challenge like today's or this yeah. week's photo theme is yellow so go out and capture something yellow or go capture movement is very open-ended it could be dancers it could be a train could be a bug but or you just go find the cheap software and pick select a color no no don't do that <laughs> that better not be a theme i'm, I'm out of that group of selective colors a theme <laughs> All right, so let's get to the bulk of what this episode is supposed to be about. <laughs> we, we just talked about a whole bunch of really great stuff. And honestly, that could probably just be an episode right there. 
But we're not yeah, done. Yeah, you're welcome to the episode, everybody. Yeah, you, <laughs> you're probably wondering, okay, Dano, when are we going to talk about art class making you a better photographer and how can I be better? <laughs> Uh, so here we are. So we're going we're gonna to get into it. So uh, freshman year in high school, I had art class, right? Everyone does. And what did you do in art class? Do you remember the projects? You remember what you learned? Probably not. Well, most people don't. Even artists usually don't really remember a whole lot from your first art class in high school. But I do. Because what I learned in that class, I realized it was putting words and vocabulary and explanations yeah. to the things that were already in my head since childhood. And these are things like color, line, perspective, contrast, symmetry, uh, values, you know, like the, these concepts are what are called principles of art. In other places, you'll find them called elements of art. So as I started to learn these things, I realized all these things that are, you know, my, my Borg homework assignments, like make a piece of <laughs> art that has lots of line in it and you yeah. know, make something interesting with lines or make something interesting with just color or texture, like, you know, yeah run-of-the-mill projects, but uh, those, those yeah. really stuck with me because I started to apply those to my photography because I was doing photography at the time kind of as a hobby. It was really like a mm -hmm. creative outlet. I did not consider myself a photographer. I did not even take pictures of people yet. <laughs> um, it was strictly abstract and like still stuff. Because it's so intimidating to take pictures of people. <laughs> it, it really can be, uh, especially if you've yeah. got any kind of social anxiety, if you're an introvert. Or the client's not feeling it or oh, you're yeah. not feeling it. It's like, yeah. ugh. How do you ask someone can I take a picture of you without sounding like a creeper, right? <laughs> That's another episode right there. But um, yeah, so I was applying these principles of art and these elements of art to my photography, and uh, it just really helped me a lot. I could tell my photos had more meaning. They had more, yeah. I don't know, when you looked at it, you wanted to look at it longer. When you looked at it, you wanted to feel an emotion or you wanted to think about something. Whereas if you don't have those things in your photos, they're just what I call snapshots. You know, anyone can take a snapshot with a phone of a moment. Yeah. Anyone can point a phone camera at someone and hit the shutter button, but that's not yeah. a, a, a portrait necessarily. I mean, sure, it could be a portrait technically, but it's not a piece of art. Um, so getting from snapshots to purposeful, meaningful, and interesting photos, it can be a long journey, but um, mm -hmm. but the, you, applying principles of art really helped me. So let me just really quickly go over about, what is this, eight of these, and there's about 13, I think, 12 or 13, depending on where you look. But I just picked out the main, you know, most easily understood ones without getting into the real deep, complicated ones. But uh, yeah, so the first one is a line. So lines draw your eye from one point to another point on the photo. No duh, right? Yeah. But when you start to use lines to draw the viewer's eye to your subject, or maybe from your subject to a secondary point of focus in your photo, you can really use it as a tool for storytelling. Next is value. So value refers to the changes in light value, which can draw the attention, again, to your subject or to something else in the photo. So value, yeah. think of it as brightness, right? In the photo editing world, we kind of call it exposure mm -hmm. or brightness. Um, so you may have a, uh, a bit of sun shining down the wall in a diagonal stripe, whereas the other parts are still in shadow. You can put your subject in that stripe of light, and boom, you've, you, you're using value to highlight your subject and to make something more interesting, right? Yeah. If someone's wearing a dark shirt, you can put them in front of a white wall and maybe there's dark parts of the wall on either side or there's you know checkers or something like that. You can use changes in light value to um, to make your photo more interesting and meaningful and, uh, and just more more dynamic. When you don't have enough values in a photo, your photo is gray and, and dull and not dynamic, not interesting to the eye because it's all the yeah. same value. It's all kind of mid-tones and mid-gray. But when you get mm. contrast, like there's there's bright whites and there's dark blacks, that's when your photo can really pop. All right, next is space. So space refers to the positive or negative space in a composition. So if I've got a photo um, of a whole bunch of cars, I'm using a drone shooting straight downwards on the highway, and there's a bunch of just cars stacked up, you know, bumper to yeah. bumper, the space, there's no negative space. It's all positive space because there's something there on each area of the photo. There's a bunch of cars filling up my scene. If there was mm -hmm. one car then there's a lot of negative space because the, the subject is a car. Empty road around them is a negative space. So how busy or non-busy your photo is is also a good tool to use. You don't want your yeah, photo yeah. too busy unless maybe you're going for that. Maybe you want you know to give the feeling of someone being lost in a crowd. So you have a really busy photo of someone still and then the crowd rushing around them with motion blur or something creative like that. Um, you can have a busy composition on purpose. But also minimalism is sort of the flip-flop. You might want something super clean and super minimalistic. 
with very little in the scene except for your subject. That is using space. Next is color. So the use of colors can enhance or highlight something in your photo. You may have a very dull background, but your subject has uh, dull colors on their clothes as well, but maybe they're holding a red rose. And that red rose is the most colorful thing in the photo. Now, this is not selective color. <laughs> don't, don't get me started <laughs> on that. We're doing in-camera selective color where everything is color, but there's not nothing is quite as colorful as the rose or as the sign they're holding or as maybe their costume. Maybe their clothes are very vibrant, but they're in front of yeah. a dull or opposite colored background. Now you're using color to highlight and emphasize your subject. You, know, you can use color wrong in that you can have con clashing colors that are just kind of distracting. Maybe the background is too colorful and your subject isn't very colorful. Now you're not utilizing color in a helpful way because the viewer doesn't know what to look at. They know they're supposed to look at the person, but subconsciously their eye is drawn to everything else in the colorful background. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't you don't want that normally. You don't want that. <laughs> Next is texture. So texture refers to how a surface or area or an object in your photo feels. Is it a grungy, you know, rough concrete wall? Or is it maybe a smooth satin dress that's flowing in the wind? The texture um, is, is a, a more minor detail, but when you can use textures, maybe contrasting textures, uh, you can really make an interesting photo. Okay, second to last is emphasis, which is when you draw the viewer's attention to something through contrast. And then the last is movement. You're drawing the viewer's eye through an image. So from one point to another. Yeah. I have a photo where a dancer has her arms, one arm is up and one arm is down. And you can tell by the curvature of her arm, she's kind of twisting, like she's almost doing like a backstroke, like she, you know, like she's swimming. And uh, it's the movement of her dress flung in the wind and her arms and the way it is, even though it's a still photo and there's no motion blur, there's implied motion. Um, you know, other things like posture, like if someone's running, you can fake a running pose if someone has the right you know, body posture and, and angles going on. Um, but uh, motion can be very powerful and interesting. And you can also have real motion. You can actually have someone riding a bike really fast and get some motion blur. Some of the more easy to understand principles of art that uh, I incorporated into my photos, and it really helped me to make my photos more artful, more interesting, and really stand out from you know the sea of snapshot photographers out there. Yeah, yeah. So in closing, I wanted to say a few, uh, four kind of closing points. The first is don't, as a photographer, don't take pictures, create art. So I try as often as I can to not say PICS, P-I-C-S. I feel like that is just such a low quality term <laughs> to <laughs> refer to me. Like, hey, let's just go take some pics. Like, no, that's not, that does not sound professional. It does not sound excellent. Um, even pictures or photos, I feel, are just too standard. So I, I like to tell my clients that I'm creating art for you, especially if it's like a family portrait or a wedding portrait. Yeah. I am making a piece of art. You happen to be in that piece of art. And therefore, it's a great sentimental memory to you, which increases the value. Of course, that's why they want to buy it. But I'm making art for you guys. I'm going to hang this in your home yeah. for you because I believe this is an important piece of art. So that's how I refer to my pictures. Uh, is not as pictures, but as art. And that also kind of leads me down certain thought processes when I'm planning a photo shoot. How can I make this more artful, more interesting, more beautiful? Next is capture the moment and tell a story. So don't just take a snapshot, but get in the moment and capture in a way that it will allow you to relive that memory in 50 years. You know, we have a handful of just classic historic photos um, that are shot throughout history. You know, like the the couple kissing um, after they got back, uh, the, after the guy got back from the war. Um, there's a yeah. protester standing in front of the tank. Like these historic moments are important because they're history, right? Well, when I'm photographing a family or a wedding, that's history too, just for that family. So I want to mm -hmm. capture in a way that will allow them to just get immersed in the moment and allow them to bring it back and, and recall the emotions that they felt in that moment. And if it's not a portrait where I'm trying to help someone remember, you know, a moment, maybe it's just a creative photo and I want to tell a story. I want the viewer to feel an emotion. Then that's what I'm thinking. That's what I go in thinking as I go in to take the photo. Like, how can I make this portray powerfulness? Or how can I make this character portray sadness or loneliness, you know, um, those, yeah. those mindsets will help me make my photos tell a story. All right. Third point is find out what you love most. This is super huge, especially when you want to make money on photography and video is find your niche, you know, find your strength. Um, oh, for sure. 
don't dump all the other categories just yet because one of those weak categories may actually be your ticket to success. You got to try them yeah. all and don't quit too early. But you do want to eventually specialize into one or two categories, which is your for sure strength and more importantly, your passion. Um, you know, I love cosplay. It's fun. I, mm -hmm. I love getting immersed into the fandoms and the, the nerdy geeky details of a character or a weapon or whatever, or the, the world behind them. Um, so I'm, I'm passionate about that. And I don't plan on stopping anytime soon, but I'm glad that I found that. It was really just a weird, you know, process of events that led me to doing cosplay photography. Um, but find that thing that you're super passionate about and be so good at it that people will have to pay you ridiculous amounts of money to get your photos. <laughs> and that is not a con artist thing to say. Um, honestly, <laughs> That's a good problem I, to have. I, yeah, I stand behind that. It's make your stuff so good that people will have to pay you a lot of money for it. And that, you know, your photos will be worth that amount of money too. All right, and last point is know your value as a photographer. And this kind of reiterates what I just said is know your value as a photographer and what you're doing. You're capturing moments that in some cases will never, ever happen again. And in many cases, the family would, you know, surely like to recall or like to look back one day in the future and remember when little Timmy was two or, you know, when little Susie, you know, was a princess into princess stuff back when she was a kid, you know? Like these are important moments. So when you realize that you are actually offering a very valuable service, that will change a lot of things in your mindset about how you price yourself, where you spend your time and what you tell your clients about what you do. Um, so know your value and don't charge for anything less. You know, if you're trying to do this as a career, as a, a living, a full-time living, you know, you need X amount of money every month to, to live. And if you say, well, I can't charge, I, I could never make $4,000 a month for my photography, that mindset right there is cutting your value in half or, or more or, or, you know, yeah. or, or worse. So you need to realize that you've got value uh, and, and you should charge accordingly that will match that value and uh, will, will make this a sustainable income if that's what you're going for. And even if it's not what you're going for, don't ever say, well, it's just pictures or I, you're right. I'm, I'm really just pressing a button. I, I don't need to charge anything over $200 for this. Yeah. You know, this is it just anyone can take a picture with a camera, right? That kind of mindset yeah. is what the client will bring to the table. And they may try to argue with you about your prices because they're thinking that way. Yeah. They don't know the value of a photographer or a videographer. Um, oh, for sure. Uh, trust me. <laughs> you know, I feel like videographers get undervalued more by the clients. They don't know how important of a good videographer is. <laughs> That's a whole nother episode. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm yeah, just it is. Well, they'll they'll know it once they get a piece of crap video, and they're like, "What did I just pay two thousand dollars for?" <laughs> well, uh, that's about it for me. Uh, I'm glad I got all that off my chest. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Nate, anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. I'm over here taking notes. I'm just like, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> a, a whirlwind of info dump. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we really appreciate the people that reached out to Daniel to yes. give some of their little bit of feedback. That was really awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for chiming in. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I like to get more listener feedback on the episode and just other people's feedback. I mean, the people who wrote yeah. are not, I don't think they're listeners of the podcast. Maybe they will be after this one. But um, I, I love getting real people's responses and opinions yeah. about something we're talking about specifically onto the show. So if you guys have an opinion about anything we talk about, it might be a movie review. It might be talking about sci-fi or photography. Um, write us. And you know what? We take voice memos too. Like if you just are on the road or you don't want to type up an email, um, just hit the voice memo app and record, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds of something and email it to us. We would love to hear, literally hear from you. And if you'd like, we may even put it on the podcast. That would be kind of cool. Yeah. I'd get some, some real listener feedback, you know, on the show. So uh, let us know your thoughts on any episodes you listen to. You can email us at tvvpodcast at gmail.com, or you can just comment on any of our social media posts for this episode and uh, let us know what you think, okay? Well, we hope you learned something awesome from this episode and were inspired. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll be with you next week. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find our previous episodes there and listen whenever you want. We love to hear from our listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, you can reach us at tvvpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and have a great week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-ta. Toodles now. TTYL. Oh, gosh. <laughs>